in the light of knowing how paradoxes can occur in logical systems, how undecidability can occur in logical systems. We found out that the parallel lines hypothesis for Euclid was undecidable from the propositions that he gave. We've equally discovered that with Bertrand Russell's barber paradox, it's undecidable who should shave the barber. It's paradoxical. So we now want to drive all of that forward and revisit those paradoxes and undecidabilities in the context of what, if you like, the pioneer of computer science, Alan Matheson Turing. What did he do? Turing started his research activity in the mid-1930s and his research field was mathematical logic. His approach to doing mathematical logic wasn't just as a dry set of propositions of the sort that Frege and Hilbert and Russell were doing, although he was well aware of their work, of course. And he was very well aware of Gödel's work, basically showing that any system of propositions was necessarily incomplete. But no, Turing had this wonderful idea of inventing almost like a, a mechanical machine, except it was a pencil and paper exercise. Now, some of you who've seen the Busy Beaver videos will see Turing machines in action. There's also been a video by my colleague Mark Jago showing you in a very high level kind of way, but very effectively, why Turing's halting problem really is undecidable. This pencil and paper computer, using nothing but a, a paper tape for data, a set of program instructions, and a read-write head that moves, that was sufficient, he said, quite rightly, to compute anything that could be computed. And it's no good saying, well, will quantum computers go beyond those? Not at the moment. Quantum computers at the moment, still in the end, end up doing Turing machines faster and in parallel, but there's nothing radically new about them as yet. Who knows what may happen in the long run. Turing's famous 1936 paper then was about David Hilbert's Entscheidungs problem. Turing, of course, knowing of Gödel's work and having played around with his Turing machines, basically said there's going to be things here that are undecidable. And it very, very soon occurred to him that an obvious one to do was the halting problem. Is it decidable whether that program with that data will halt? And the answer is, in certain special cases, yes, you can. But is there a general formula that says yes or no? No. At the nuts and bolts level, the busy beaver problem helps you to understand how this comes about. But at the more philosophical level, if you've seen Mark Jago's video about how that wonderful machine works, if you look at the machine you'll find that inside it there's a, a thing called H. What it does is it says, give me a program P, give me its data, its input, which we'll call I. Will that P with that I halt? Is it generally decidable? This is the magic H machine. Now, what Mark then did, which may have baffled some of you, but I want to refer this back now to what we know about things like barber paradoxes and so on. If you recall the barber paradox, it says, the barber shaves all those in the village who do not shave themselves. In order to show that something leads to a paradox and there is, therefore is undecidable, it's got to have that element of notness in it, as Bertrand Russell might easily have said. Where does the not come in in... Uh, Mark and Sean's model, the H taking a P, taking an I. Look at the video and you'll see they do two bolt-on extras at the rear of that machine. And all that those bolt-on extras are doing is reversing the logic. If the inner H has decided that it does halt and delivers a yes, then the outer machine turns the yes into spinning round in a loop and not halting. Conversely, if the inner machine H says, no, it doesn't stop, I can see it's looping, then the outer machine says, oh, I'm going to reverse the logic. I'm going to turn a no into a yes. So the outer machine H plus is basically putting the element of notness and denying at the back of the H machine. And once you've done that, you can model the barber paradox with the H plus machine. Just as you say, to ask of the barber make him reflect on himself, should I shave myself or should I not shave myself, equally with the H plus machine you say, okay, 
I'm going to feed myself to myself. I'm going to have the H plus machine with H plus as the program and H plus as its data input. And I've now got to say, do I halt? So I'm going to restate the Barber paradox as follows. H plus delivers a halt for all those Turing machines that do not halt themselves. So in other words, if the inner H machine comes back and says, yes, it halts, you say, no, we're not having it halt, we we'll make it spin. But for the ones where it says, no, it hasn't stopped, it's spinning, it's going to come back and say, yes, it does halt. So in other words, the outer add-on is forcing a halt on you and saying, yes, I can make the whole thing halt. So if H plus delivers a halt for all those Turing machines that do not halt themselves, then what Turing machine is it that causes H plus to halt? And as you look at it, you realise, oh, it's exactly the same as the barber. So, fine. I think the only problem with this, if you like, philosophical way of doing things, and I felt this very strongly when I finally sort of got to grips with this stuff because I had to teach it to people, is what sort of system is it which requires you to drive yourself into a paradox to get a proof? I mean, how does this all affect me as an ordinary computer scientist writing ordinary programs? If you're just doing calculations involving, I don't know, statistics, website maintenance, weather prediction and so on, fine. You're not going to be bothered by this. But the key word, I think, is self-referential. You get into difficulties with anything that's self-referential. The barber problem is self-referential because it's saying the barber is a man as well as a barber. Look inside the system, what happens? Bertrand Russell's paradox is self-referential. It's looking inside the set of all sets. Turing's halting problem is self-referential. It's getting a machine to examine other machines. So I felt like swearing a sort of scout's oath and saying, I promise I will never write a a program that analyzes other programs, thereby I can avoid trouble. But actually, if you're a computer scientist, you can't totally avoid trouble. This stuff does come to bite you. Because I suddenly started to think, ah, I'm not going to write a program that analyzes other programs, but I'm very interested in programs that can generate other programs. How can I prove that if I generate a program, and this conventionally happens with tools called parser generators, sometimes called compiler compilers, very similar. You give a program specification to a program and it generates another program. How can you show that that program you generate will not run into paradoxes and undecidability? Actually, if you're not careful, you'll get some nasty results come out of those and some big shocks if you're not aware of the fact that certain things are undecidable. I will eventually get round to showing you an example of this. It's basically down to just doing simple parse trees. I've done some of these before for things like A plus B star C. Sometimes you get into things where you can have more than one possible parse tree. It's ambiguous. And so you think to yourself, oh, ah, ooh, I'm writing a parser. I better just do a quick check on what's been asked of me. Just I'll do a quick check to make sure it's not going to lead to an ambiguous set of trees. No good. You could be trying to compute the uncomputable. Uh, it may be very well hidden, but you may end up in a grammar that is so complex that drives you to endless layers of recursive investigation to see if this really is uh, decidable or not. It could get every bit as bad as Ackerman in a worse case. You may say, oh, well, you know, Let's keep it finite. I promise I'll never give you anything to parse that's longer than a thousand characters. Yeah, 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 but that doesn't satisfy a mathematician. It doesn't satisfy a computer scientist. You want general, robust solutions. So what actually happens in the case of parsers is that the so-called parser generators, and there's one I hope to do with you briefly in a future movie, one called Yak, yet another compiler compiler, it has got the most ingenious hidden way of stopping you blundering into <laughs> undecidability. You give it something that's beyond its powers and it basically is incapable of knowing it's beyond its powers. It just says, under these circumstances, I am going to do this. Be warned, the parser I deliver you in these nasty circumstances may not be quite the one you expect. 
So there we are, that is an example of undecidability in action and it's nice to know for the first time that I've been able to give you a concrete example of something where you do need to beware. Now, many of you out there of course will say, yeah, fine, okay, so if you're a computer scientist and if you're writing things that generate other programs, yes, you need to beware. Need I be as aware as this if all I'm doing is maintaining a website? The answer is maybe not. If you have to get less fit before you get more fit, evolution doesn't plan, right? So it can't see that there's this huge hill off in the distance. About it. This is so dreadful. The barber shaves only those who do not shave themselves.